a sort of like really hands-on DIY uh, genius that Niles brought to this. So I feel really gifted to have uh, found and been working with Niles as my creative partner on this documentary series. It is intended to be an ongoing series to look at uh, all the other major plant entheogens and the caretakers and medicine people that are uh, the keepers of those medicines. And uh, yeah, we really would love your support in that. So even if you've seen uh, the show here to, to, today, it's screening in the Haight-Ashbury on Monday night. Uh, you can find shamansoftheglobalvillage.com. There's also um, an extended extra hour of extra scenes and longer outtakes that you can get on the, online as well. So this is Niles, I'm Rakrazam, uh, the host and producer of the show as well. And I'm very pleased to have with us today Mr. Alexander Ward, all the way from the UK. Yeah. Alex, uh, your position is with Divine Arts, the, the company who's published Octavio's book. Yeah, um, we actually have a store downstairs selling like the Toad of Dawn uh, book, which is kind of the story. I got to wrap along to that. So <laughs> that. Uh, we don't have we don't have a we don't have a mic in here, I guess. Right? We'll just have to speak up. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Just talk yeah. loud. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we published uh, okay. Octavio's book called The Toad of Dawn, and that goes into a lot of the backstory behind uh, his work with the medicines, how he first encountered it, and goes. He's a really good writer and sort of being able to delve deep into his own self and really describe his own experiences, especially overcoming his crack uh, cocaine addictions and uh, healing that with the 5 meo DMT. And uh, I was also fortunate to uh, meet Octavio with the publishers and we had our own 5 meo DMT experience. And I'm someone who comes from a background of a lot of uh, ayahuasca ceremonies and uh, this was kind of the, the pinnacle of the psychedelic experience for me. It was, very much like a closing chapter in my entire journey with it. And uh, since then, I've not really felt the need to do any other psychedelic medicine. That was just kind of it for me. I felt like I, I'd seen what I needed to mm. with it, and now it's just trying to put that information and those experiences into <coughs> various art projects and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you try to project. Oh, sorry. yeah. And this, this project would not have been made without the help of Divine Arts. So, you know, yeah, so Michael Weese, who's the uh, yeah. owner of Divine Arts, was the executive producer. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. And so our uh, next esteemed panelist is Dr. Joseph Basuglia, who uh, works at the, the Crossroads Clinic uh, in Mexico with uh, helping treat people with addictions and uh, with Ibogaine and with 5-MeO-DMT as well. And you're a presenter here at the conference. You've got a, a poster on some of the, the neuroscience behind 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, Psychological science. Psychological, you. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm a research psychologist and uh, program director at Crossroads, which is in Mexico, using Ibogaine 5 meo like Rex said, I'm a, a research therapist with the phase three study with MDMA in Los Angeles. And um, we have a couple research projects happening, and this medicine for me was kind of like Alexander, like peak moment, uh, and from the first experience I had with it, I felt just an imperative call to, to research it and share it. And um, with, uh, addiction in particular, it's you can take it to the bank that when someone uses this medicine, they're going to have a mystical experience. And what we know from the literature is that that is the change agent of, of psychedelics and addiction. So it's it's very um, salient and potent and um, effective in, in disrupting addiction. And um, the, the three things that we're working on now, we have a poster here on the floor, which uh, we use this mystical experiences questionnaire, which is kind of a classic uh, self-report scale in psychedelic literature with psilocybin and LSD. And um, administered this to people in the program to see how, how 5-MeO kind of lined up in terms of its mystical intensity. And at Crossroads, we use a pretty conservative dose of the medicine. Uh, it's about 50 milligrams. Uh, so the 5-MeO content is somewhere about 5 to 7 milligrams. And the take home from the poster is essentially like a, a low dose of 5-MeO is as potent as moderate to high dose psilocybin in, in an occasioning a mystical experience. Uh, the other one is Octavio graciously in his field work, he collected handwritten testimonials of people that were on the medicine. And so he has this catalog of about 600 uh, handwritten accounts in Spanish of what people experienced when they, they came through the medicine. And so. Uh, myself and Jose in the back and a bunch of Crossroads uh, research team were going through using sort of an ethnographic kind of grind theory approach to see what's the language that people are using before we start uh, studying this with all the other lenses that are in psychedelic science. What is What wants to arise and emerge from this medicine? How is it different? What are the experiences people are having? So 
we're doing linguistic analysis and kind of just coding recurring themes that people are, are, are reporting. And um, the third one is really exciting. Um, there's a number of people, of course, who are working with this underground, and um, we created an online survey, myself and then uh, Alan Davis at Bowling Green University, um, in partnership with uh, Bob Grant, who's interested in collecting initial data that could be used for developing safety studies and phase one studies with this uh, drug and medicine um, for users. So it's an open online survey. You can all take it, if, walk it please do if you, if you use the medicine. And it looks, looks at uh, short term, long term effects, both positive and adverse, uh, psychedelic experiences, near death experiences, personality experiences. So uh, this is my, I feel like this is my mission now why I'm here on earth. <laughs> so I, excited about all things this and my previous uh, work I was a Christian pastor and I feel like this kind of is the nexus of, of mystic spirituality and science and healing and um, as a psychologist and especially in trauma uh, the whole challenge is how do you get someone to go into their body and, and access nonverbal somatic things through a verbal medium and um, in my own healing, in my own training, I was in therapy for 15 years, and the first time I smoked 5-MeO, I felt like all the things I was striving for and reaching for uh, to connect the dots in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, it sort of was like, like lube, <laughs> healing lube, that accelerated and, and really fused together a lot of um, what my soul and, and my psyche were, were yearning for. And at Crossroads, we see profound things that I think video is, is really needs to be captured about this because you see somatic manifestations and healings that, that you don't see on other psychedelics. You see mudras, you see people going into yogic poses that have never done yoga. Uh, it's it's mind-boggling, so I'll, I'll pause there. And I brought a couple um, uh, testimonies too, just short little paragraphs uh, from these if you want to read them later. Yeah, maybe I'll just pick up and point out, like Alex sort of talked about this a bit as well, it's like, I think we say in the, in the film, it's like, it feels to me subjectively and to most people who experience this that it is the most powerful of the antigens out there. Um, and it's interesting, your work with the, you know, comparing it to psilocybin, high dose, low dose. Uh, it's capturing it in media, I feel a real uh, duty of care, you know, um, in facilitating, I guess, showing how we show these these substances and the container that we, we bring to the general public in making documentaries about them. And we see the effects, like in the very dramatic footage on the island. Um, and it's, uh, it's incredibly powerful stuff. And people that have worked with plant medicines previously, or with meditation as especially, is a very, very good uh, sort of scaffolding or structure internally to give you a pathway when you go into a full release. Um, and like uh, Joseph said, in my two years since I first Sat with Octavio. I was working with ayahuasca for that decade before that, but everything just sort of became about 5-MeO. Like I'd start meeting 5-MeO people, there'd be more this blossoming of the culture out there, more facilitators, more research being done. But there's something so powerful in it, and it seems to me that in the in the moment of taking it, no matter where or who or what, and of course, set and setting is crucially important, and especially the ceremony and. Uh, as Octavio pointed out, it doesn't always have a very um, uh, distinct lineage. There's uh, representations in a lot of the Mesoamerican traditions, but there's not an unbroken lineage as there is with ayahuasca or even with the, the psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico or some of the other plant medicines. Uh, but it almost feels like it's the global sacrament because the one thing is that the tryptamines and 5-MeO is endogenous to, to the human uh, consciousness itself. And uh, it's, it is an overwhelmingly uh, powerful experience, and yet it also somehow seems guided and this mystical terminology, I do a lot of um, lectures and talks around plant medicines and shamanisms and more and more I just find it inescapable to not revert to sort of more mystic terminology. And it's, so it's very interesting that the psilocybin studies and looking at the mystical experience is coming into even the medical fold as they study uh, this substance because it seems to be a very, very direct route to what in uh, sort of neuroscience communities they call non-dual states but you know, is actually a unity state, is it really that real alignment with central source. And it's, in, it's, it's not a verbal thing, it's not an intellectual thing from my understanding, working with some neuroscientists doing before and after EEG readings uh, around the toad medicine, 
um, it really collapses the prefrontal cortex and that uh, intellectual egoic pathway is completely flatlined and then perhaps older pathways uh, of consciousness, whether that's the heart with the neuronal cells or the microbacteria of the gut, seem to come into play and it's just that unity consciousness which is on a full release inescapable. So it's just incredibly profound and yet I really feel the delicacy to try to communicate that in a, in a humble way. It's very difficult because um, we don't necessarily want to be encouraging everyone to go out and try 5-MeO or the scarcity of your toad and a lot of those issues around uh, conservation and uh, you know respect to the indigenous cultures as well. But uh, it is such a powerful experience and it's interesting that it is happening at this time when we've had a generation or so of plant medicine experience, stepping stone from the ecstasy revolution in the 80s and the LSD revolution in the 60s. It's like on some larger intergenerational stepping stone, I almost feel like we're being groomed for uh, our ability to hold full bandwidth of spectrum of consciousness, which is what the toad is bringing in now. Um, yes. Does uh, anyone want to? Yeah, I, I definitely concur with that idea that, I mean, for me, the 5-MeO DMT, I didn't have any visions with it, but it was just the highly most concentrated experience of just being connected to that oneness of spirit. And uh, in other ways where, I mean, the, the strength of it really took me by surprise. And in other ways with the ayahuasca medicine where I might be able to hide away from certain things that the medicine was trying to teach me, the 5-MeO DMT was just this hugely strong wave that just crashed into me and I was stuck initially on the floor in this loop of the medicine was trying to show me the source of uh, rare things in my life that I was not very happy with and it was causing certain you know personality traits that was causing me how I act in daily life and I think Octavia as well, Octavia as well he kept guiding me back to that kind of like source part of me that was creating that personality of myself and it's creating like a real big like hold on life of myself trying to control too much. And then the medicine was really teaching me just to let go of that. Mm. And once I was able to do that, um, just that whole sense of feeling oneness with the universe just sort of flowed right into me. And there was another person present in the ceremony and I could see behind the, the person's eyes just this one spirit. And there was just this merging of all the faces of humanity onto this one person. And I'd never seen that so distinctly behind the eyes of another person. I felt it in little bits working with the psilocybin and feeling that connectedness to nature around me, but the 5-MeO DMT really showed me that kind of one spirit that's behind the eyes of every individual. Mm -hmm. mm, right. And we had an initial question about dosage too, so maybe we'll just speak to that a bit because you know, as the, one of the filmmakers that made the show, obviously here I am kind of shooting the ceremony and then actually did do a very small dosage of the medicine after we, you know, finished the cameras. And it was, uh, of course, about the smallest dose you could possibly take, but it was still the most life-changing thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> so, um, and then on top of that, with full disclosure, you know, you saw Dave take probably the largest, you know, amount of... It was of, a big pot. That was a big pot. You saw him take probably yeah. the largest amount we've ever seen anybody take on, you know, who knows if it's the most anybody's ever taken ever. And so he was, there's huge sensitivities about the amount that he took and how, you know, the aftermath of what happened with it. So it's very serious stuff. And do you want to maybe speak a little bit to dosage and about how much time? I, I, was, I was in an experience for five minutes. Dave was down for an hour. So it does vary. Um, Look, if you're in a full release, I mean, basically it's like the way people approach the medicine is how they approach death. Really, I mean, it's ego death. I mean, it's like 11 years of working with ayahuasca and then I'm there on the Malacca floor, I'm like, I surrender. I surrender, my madre, do what you want. I surrender, I surrender. But it's the ego saying I surrender. It's not the full surrender, right? And as Alex was saying, this medicine, um, you know, it is endogenous. It finds the synaptic pathways, the serotonin pathways. It locks and loads and adds to you, your own capacity. And it just melts. It melts the full ego away and like, we identify with the ego and we think we are the ego and the psychedelic experience is really great to uh, to give more elasticity to that that uh, concept of what we really are and we know we can have out of body and trans dimensional experiences but usually on most entheogens you are journeying through another terra incognita the invisible landscape some bardo state or some type of experience uh, on the 5-MeO DMT it's the classic mystical white light and it it just totally kills you, you know, in a beautiful way. Because at the same time, it's not doing it to you, it's revealing that you are it, because you're merging. It's revealing, it's blossoming within you. 
Um, so the dosage thing is very difficult because we, there's, um, there's been work with synthetic DM, uh, 5-MeO DMT. That can be measured a lot more accurately and there's uh, practitioners that do work in the West with the synthetic. And for scientific research, I think that is pretty much a better way to do it. It takes the stress off the toads and the sustainability, but it's actually a lot more replicable. You can cut down on all the variables in the science. And uh, for me, the synthetic toad argument or question that usually comes up, is there a difference? It's almost like you know browsers on a, on a, a computer. It's like Internet Explorer and Chrome. It's like they go to the same space, but there is a subtle flavor that's different, but it's definitely the same depth of experience. Uh, with the, the Buffo Alvarius toad, because as we saw in the documentary, um, it's a living creature. And this happens with the acacias, I know as well, is that when you're collecting the DMT from plants, shrubs, or the trees, uh, same with the toads, they vary in potency according to the time of day, perhaps, or the season, or the gender or age of the toad or the plant, because they are living creatures, you know, and they have their own internal cycles. And then you need a certain amount of the toad medicine for an active dose, and as Octavio showed, it's usually crushed up together. So there's a spectrum of toad uh, dried secretions in there, and the active ingredient uh, isn't the full body weight of the material. So it's very hard to get a correct dosage. And you know, in the more medical model, and the more there's more and more uh, scientists and uh, NGOs examining uh, the role of 5-MeO in consciousness, as Joseph has sort of um, shown with some of his studies. Uh, and <coughs> in a medicalization model, yes, measurement is uh, the way to go. But in Octavio's style, is shamanic. He comes from that lineage. He's really uh, more hands-on, more that sort of warrior initiation style. And I've watched him over the years, so it's two years since we made the documentary, but I've watched him uh, really champion the medicine, but go back to indigenous tribes across the world through his work with UNESCO and the uh, traveling around the world with other curanderos and shamans with their medicines like ayahuasca. And he's been gifted and given permission to use Yopo from uh, some of the tribes in the Amazon that use that. And uh, it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, full-on style that's just, um, it's a, it's a deep initiation. So in that sense, their idea of dosage and what they were doing in an indigenous sense is more reading the energy, looking at the person, holding that container for them. Uh, and you know, other practitioners I know of uh, may start out on lower doses, regardless of how much they give. And uh, there's many different pathways, but they all lead to that same central source. So it's hard to say with the dosage. Some people may have, like we saw in that documentary, uh, they're all friends of mine, right? And a lot of them are from Australia as well, they came over. Um, and there's something very interesting which happens with the, the tryptamines and that, that full release dosage, as well as the sort of psychic effects uh, of the full mystical experience and the unity consciousness, which I've got to say, we didn't really say, it, it, it almost gets cheesy to say it, but for me, what I feel, and a majority of people, it's, it's like being in the heart of the sun, and you are the sun, and it's this vibratory field of unconditional love. It's like the love you feel, mother to a child, or this incredible intimacy that is everything, and that's all that exists. And that's, that's very special, and that's why I say it, it's, it's, a, it's a different type of medicine. But as well as that experience of reconnecting, uh, it then does set off the endocrine system in the body, and it does flush uh, clean in some level. And so Octavio's real method and his style is really working with addictions and working with people who have addictions. Um, and I've seen this beautiful proliferation of practitioners just in the last two years that I've been uh, documenting and working with the medicine in Mexico and countries where it is legal, uh, of these various styles, of this blossoming of people that can experiment, you know, with uh, ways to heal, ways to expand consciousness, ways to reconnect to deep source. And it's, it, it really feels to me like something on that Gaian matrix, intelligent, loving level of being orchestrated is deeply going on, you know? Um, it's very <coughs> profound. But maybe that's a good segue, if Joseph could say a little bit about the work at Crossroads and yeah. uh, the Ibogaine and how the 5-MeO complements that. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the dosing issue is really crucial because it's so powerful uh, experientially and then everything that has a experiential correlate has a biological correlate. So what's happening in the brain, it's, it's really potent. So um, we know it's like a vasoconstrictor, so it can, it can raise the blood pressure, accelerate the heart rate. Um, there's some question of serotonin toxicity, serotonin syndrome, if there's really high doses. Um, I appreciate both ways, the shamanic warrior way, and, and there is an aspect of this medicine that you kind of just need to die. Like, you kind of need to have that death experience to 
get the full experience, but it also pushes into to risk. Um, it's a letting go. Yeah. yeah. I like, I just like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so, yeah, so, so with Crossroads, yeah, we, we do 50 milligrams of, of toad venom, which is, if you assume 10 to 15 percent uh, 5-MeO content, uh, the 5-MeO would be somewhere between 5 to 7, 8 milligrams. Um, there's other tryptamines in the, in the bufotoxin that need to be published, that some, some people are looking at that. Uh, my sense with the synthetic versus the, the bufo is that the bufo does have additional uh, somatic uh, benefits. I've seen people with the bufos compared to the synthetic have more uh, kind of gut brain alignment where people are able to have catharsis and um, a lot of kind of kundalini uh, experiences, um, people that have had sexual trauma that are kind of dissociated from their, their core and their abdomen and their root uh, can have sexual awakenings. We've had women have um, full body orgasms that have been <coughs> shut down, closed down. Um, but I, I think there's different ways of doing it. I, I kind of like the progressive microdose where it's like something like 10, 30, 50, uh, a, a step wise into the surrender. If people I find are more like um, neurotically organized or obsessive and kind of white knuckling their own psyche, it uh, can be terrifying for people, mm -hmm. profoundly terrifying. Yeah. And, and, and I've seen people have PTSD from 5-MeO, um, mm -hmm. more so from the synthetic, from not myself, but just what I've heard in the underground. Um, it's, it's, you really need to have some practice in letting, in letting go and surrendering yeah. and, and all that work that you do in, in float tanks and meditation and all that can serve you well in, in this. So I think there's not a one size fits all and then who knows the genetic metabolic differences that need to be kind of explored from person to person. And uh, Dr. Jerry said he went to one country and it had like no effect on anybody and, and Finland, yeah. or you went to some country, and it was just, yeah. 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 Well, we have about, we have 30, 30 or 40 minutes, so, so we can just kind of open it up to questions here. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, more of a comment uh -huh. on this particular dialogue. Yes, yes, sir. Um, so in, in terms of dosing, what I've become aware of uh, is that it, it's far less about the dose and far more about the individual's ability to surrender. Mm. And yes. that different people have different relationships with what surrender is and what releasing egoic structure is. And having some familiarity with uh, both the bufotoxins, synthetics, and um, extracts, uh, I haven't been witness to really any distinctions other than the subtle ones that Rack is talking about. Very, very subtle distinctions in that. Like some of the things that you had mentioned, I've certainly witnessed in other contexts, people being able to release. Um, what I've seen in terms of synthetic usage is that depending on a person's personal history with being able to release, if somebody has little to no experience with psychoactives at all, or they know themselves to be vastly sensitive, usually a dose of pure 5-MeO-DMT would be somewhere in the five to seven milligram range. Somebody with a bit more experience, some LSD experience, some psilocybin experience, um, eight to 12 milligrams of pure synthetic 5-MeO-DMT. If people have extremely, uh, a lot of experience with ayahuasca, in fact, we found that the more people, the more experience they have with uh, working with tryptamines like ayahuasca on a long-term basis, they may need more, and those can go anywhere mm -hmm. from 13 to 20 plus milligram doses with pure 5-MeO-DMT. And I think the, the weight thing too is important. Sometimes it's completely independent of weight. Yeah, body weight. Do, Ralph Messner in The Toad and the Jaguar says that body weight matters. Um, uh, anecdotal reports have it that it really doesn't. Uh, there have been reports of 250 pound men uh, getting a full release experience on as little as five milligrams. Uh, I am aware of anecdotal reports of a 98 pound four foot eight inch woman taking four 15 milligram hits of pure 5-MeO back to back over the course of 20 minutes, achieved full release, same person now, three to four milligrams of 5-MeO-DMT will induce a full release. So there's uh, reverse tolerance uh, aspects that are going there where there's myelination likely happening in the neural pathways that allow people to get there 
with less and less. And once a person has achieved what that dose range is, that can be significantly lessened over time until they need barely anything at all. And that doesn't even address reactivation, which happens mm. quite frequently because mm -hmm. you're dealing with an endogenous tryptamine, not an exogenous one. Yeah. yeah, and I think there's a whole other way, just like progressive low microdosing is a powerful bodily somatic teacher for people. It uh, helps you, it kind of fully connects the nervous system. and. Just personally, I, I have been healing from Lyme disease and I had this, uh, this kind of persistent autoimmune effect and chronic pain and I found it's, it kind of turns the headlights on where my energy stuck and which disc in my back is, is messed up and almost like a kind of a cannabis embodiment kind of experience. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, do we want to open it up for any questions that anybody has? I mean, regarding, you know, obviously the medicine or the series or Shut it out. You know, stigmas of crack pipes and... <laughs> That's like vibes. Toad vibes. Yeah, just some of what you're kind of talking about there, about just from PTSD, and uh, I'm just really interested in the integration process as well. As I've told you, I've come to Ireland where I'm from and done quite a few ceremonies, and I've been just like slightly concerned of, especially in Western culture, the integration process yes. and the importance of that, as well as that going hand in hand with this reactivation that seems to happen with five you know, I know a lot of people yeah. that have, have, you know, after the experience has gone back into it, maybe a couple of weeks later, maybe they smoked yep. a joint and like had a full on uh, five MEO reactivation. So yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 Well, it, and also with have uh, any, any, he's adapting. Any, yeah. yeah, and we're obviously finding that the person that we focus each episode on is so crucial because it's all about focusing honorable people that are, you know, of high moral character and nobody's perfect. So there's certainly been various criticisms of Octavia, one being what happens immediately afterwards with this kind of, you know, boom, boom, boom dynamic. And obviously integration is almost the most crucial component because we're, we're, we're all here in this realm for a reason. And it's much about how we live our lives, you know, even though we can go off in other places. It's like, why are we all here? And, you know, how do we live our life when we're back here? Yeah, look, integration is, I think, the most uh, important topic that psychedelic and shamanic culture in the West, at least, is facing. Because we've had a generation or so of plant medicines and these experiences, then what do we do with them? What does, it ha what does it do to us? The healing aspect, the physical healing or the mental healing and all of that, and then moving forward. 5-MeO, especially because we've said how powerful it is and how aligning it can be, and uh, there was some mention of this idea of reactivation. I, I like to say it's an activation. It's almost as if, you know, with the EEG studies that have been done, we know that we do have this endogenous tryptamines and 5-MeO's endogenous and in certain pathways of the brain, certain networks that are active. They've uh, proven that, um, you know, you're in different levels of consciousness, you know, beta problem solving, alpha sort of ideating, lower levels. But 5-MeO seems to induce a gamma network, which usually only lasts for less than 15 seconds, and it's the network which is all about cohesion. And I, I don't exactly know what that means in a scientific level, but I'm, I'm riffing it to think what I feel like what happens is that unity consciousness, external and internal, it's like this, it's like this snowflake, I call it a soul flake, and it's like it's just radiating outwards and connecting to everything else. Like the network, Indra's net, you know, uh, the news feel, like all these. Uh, metaphors for this interconnected web of life is alive, intelligent and communicating and you're just one node and all of a sudden you clear the signal, frontal lobes go down, boom, more unity consciousness pathway goes on and you receive full spectrum consciousness signal and then does it ever really go away, right? My theory is you're activated. The deeper levels which we used to have of this consciousness in other world ages, in the different seasons of consciousness, of, you know, the, all of prehistory, um, Australian Aboriginals called Dreamtime Consciousness. We used to be able to do this. The pathways are still there. And these external plants and earth sacraments and now the toad is helping relearn and reactivate. But if you've had the 5-MEO experience and all through history, mystics and certain people who've been more sensitive when conditions were more cleaner back then and food was organic and no EMF, people are designed to connect to source. That's what I believe. It's built in. This is the thing. We're not alone. It's there. But we've had a degradation in this world age of his story and we've lost the signal. You know, five bar galactic godhead signal. There you go. <laughs> um, and the integration thing is 
if people can have reactivations when blood sugars are lowest and you know 3 4 a.m each night that first week or month or things but it's not just that it's like when the ego gets distracted you're doing something and not you're not in the normal egoic state you're creating a pathway for it to come up again because it's on once you've been activated i believe it's on and so it's so interesting there's a slight difference i feel or almost like an icing of an entheogenic <coughs> cake globally with all the work with all the different plant medicines and then 5-meo being endogenous that the people who have done it almost create like a network or a circuit of activated people that might be sublimated but uh they're having these reactivation or activations and it's big it means that the relationship with source that's been activated within you is on from now on so then what do we do with it it's very interesting cultural vectors of where we're going to go as a shamanic culture with the 5-meo dmt experience yeah. and yes you need to do more integration there's a lot of good practitioners and solid follow-ups there's things like uh what's the la organization that does the um lamps or no the actually aware, uh, aware, aware spun off to do the integration sessions inner space inner space inner integration space. Uh, and you know, in shamanic cultures around the world in the West, integration for all these modalities is crucially important because this is how we change. This is how we have not just a peak experience outside our nine to five and go back to the system and vote for Trump or Hillary, right? This is how we transform culture by having a direct living embodiment of this experience and anchoring it and then finding the others and then coming together and sharing and maintaining the experience and being there for each other. It is so, so important in the 5-MO experience, I, I believe, to have a container where you can fully open. There's so many subtle energetics. Where you, it's, it's like making love. You said like full body orgasm. I can say the 5-MO experience is like how you will die, how you face death. It's also how you orgasm. Can you go to platform orgasm? Can you fully release into the infinite? And it's, it's so intimate and sacred and to be around people that you can trust and fully open to. So there's different styles with practitioners that might do it solo and give people that space or within a group, but a very tight container. You have to feel safe because if you don't, you're tense, you're holding on on some level and then you're not opening up on some level. And then even afterwards with the integration, if you go through this experience with a group, undoubtedly you're gonna get very close. It's like your brothers and sisters who've gone through this together. Um, yeah, I could go on, yeah. Yeah, I think there's like the, the mental preparation, there's the, it's really a body kind of experience, so it's teaching the body how to release and to surrender. And then it's also with the follow-up too, I think there's so many things like acupuncture and things that the body kind of needs to reconstitute itself. And um, there's a, a deep, profound learning that happens. And the, the re-experiencing phenomena suggests that there's some spiritual shift that's happening there's part there's something biological that's that's different that's organically different um, from this experience so pre and post LSD or pre and post cannabis before and after 5-MeO are different for people um, and uh, usually more intense um, so we got, that needs to be looked into is it is it some myelination that's happening some the corpus callosum things are more integrated uh, what you know? What is that that's happening? Because it's, it's it's from what I know, it's metabolized rapidly, so it's not hanging out in the body. It, it may be, but uh, it's it, it feels to me like it entrains a certain frequency of consciousness. Yeah, ten, it's ten, in the body. It's in yeah. the body. It's in mm. the body permanently. Whether or not it sources again and re-releases, mm. and, and getting control of that, the yogins called it nirvikalpa samadhi, and the practices of Raja Yoga were all built to induce that experience, and I believe that experience is induced by endogenous or exogenous inductions. Thank you for saying that. The, the, I'm, I'm really getting into the, uh, you know, the Vedic maps of consciousness and the Samadhi scales, and I, I interviewed this religious scholar. This is not new. This is I know, this is not new. Other cultures that have perhaps had sacraments, like in the, the Rig Veda and the Somas, and they had a, a psychedelic sacrament, but they've left behind maps of consciousness which are intricate and detailed and for me really just telegraph and totally describe 5-MeO experience. It's like you can get to the lower level doses we were describing and certain things may happen like spontaneous mudras where it's not you, you're over here and your body's just moving and it's almost as if the energy of the source in through the tryptamine mediation is calibrating you know the body and that's part of how it's realigning you and your vessel and then deeper levels of like threshold where all that's left is the witness on the edge of the great source 
but you're just witnessing. And they've got you know, levels of this, like fourth level samadhi, the reishis who witness, fifth level full release where you are that thing. And it's like these cultures have done it before, and I really feel that it's coming around again full circle, and that's what we need to integrate the, the pre previous knowledge bases. Yeah, I think that's where, like, sorry, just really quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think th that's where this is different from other psychedelic medicines because it's so transcendent and mystical and spiritual what's happening. I mean, the, the protocols, I'm like reading the MAPS protocols, and it just, it, 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 it might not work. I mean, people are, are waking yeah. up in this profound, spiritual, divine way that you can't uh, contain and contextualize in some of these manualized protocols. So me, for, for humanity, I think it's more important than, than, than developing this for some condition and an FDA drug development pathway. This is like the most important catalyst for spiritual consciousness and accessing our own divinity on the planet. I think. Yeah. Eugene, you had a question? Well, I, I just wanted to add some great I think developing a meditation practice, mm. I found to be essential to really bring that into everyday experience. Because these things show you the way, but then you have to walk the path. Right? Yeah. And what it's showing you is that pure awareness is what you are. It's you are presence. So when the ego dissolves, all these things dissolve, you're left with just pure presence, pure awareness. Yeah, and which is samadhi, right? That yeah. pure consciousness. Yeah, and we all need our fellowship. I mean, we all come to things like this to meet other people, to be in kind of, you know, communion with people that we can talk to about real things and not, you know, fake things. So you know, having a fellowship with people that have had the experience or are interested in the experience or talking to people that may have had, you know, a, a, a extensive history working with the medicine or know a lot about the medicine if you're interested in it is, is absolutely crucial and very recommended. And I found that very beneficial in, in uh, the comrades and life experiences that we've had making this show and, you know, the dynamics that have been gained from it. So, yeah. And we have a question. Annie worked at Crossroads and brought the medicine to Crossroads and she's from Hermosillo. Oh, yeah. Expert in the room. Yes, Couple there's numerous people in this room that know a lot, a lot about this. Also, uh, like Octavio as an individual uh, has learned a lot about his practices of medicine lately and been shown by others that right. does need to sort of slow down with some of his practices and allow more of a sort of aftercare process. Uh, so that is something that he has taken on board uh, quite recently. Yeah, and he's, he's, a, he's a young lad. He's, a, he's a, you know, the perfect person to put on camera, but obviously there's a, he's, he's this archetypal figure. And you know what? This, this um, type of activity of people defending something that needs to be addressed in a more open way is something that I really feel strongly that a dialogue needs to be initiated around. Let's go. Let's, Let's do it. Let's go. Yeah. So, yes, sure. and I'm, my name is Annie, and I'm speaking from the point of view of being born and raised. Water, of being born and raised in the Sonoran Desert. And having grown up with these toads and seeing what's have been happening since 2012, since Octavio started traveling the world and bringing the medicine out of, out of Sonora. And so, you know, first of all, I want to say congratulations on the film. It's beautifully shot. Um, first episode, I'm sure you guys are going to do really great things. At the same time, I want to say that I want to present an invitation to start assessing the veracity of the cultural narrative. You guys show some very compelling images from the Mayans and the Aztecs, but to connect the Mayans and the Aztecs to the Cetis is a long Huge stretch. stretch. We're, we're, we're not saying there's an unbroken lineage at all, though. No, but Octavio, but there is a connection. his whole plot line is that he reintroduced the practice. And to make, to make matters very short, let's just say this is the prime example of the white man taking advantage of an indigenous community. And you guys are in That's a strong that statement, Annie. Right? I, I see where you're coming from. But to put it in context, he stayed there, not giving them toad medicine for, I believe, it's like up to three years as their GP, like working with them, seeing the problems in the community, seeing the addictions, and as he discovered the use of toad medicine and it could work for him, going to the village elders, giving them the medicine, clearing the addictions within them and getting permission to then give it to other people in the village. It is complicated and I totally hear what you're saying and I'd like to hear more. Okay. Well, and, and you know, I do want to say a personal comment and, and it's actually a question. I'm trying to understand the mentality of uh, images earlier in the film of uh, multiple times showing kilos 
and kilos of medicine, of sacred medicine, being poured from one container to the other. What is the rationale behind that? To me, I so apologize for saying this, mm. but to me, that is sacred medicine pornography. What, 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 is, well, what is the mechanism behind okay, that? Okay, what, what is, is pornography? What is sacred sexuality? Now, we're talking about the same thing from different perspectives, I totally agree. We're media makers, that's why I said at the start, I really totally understand you because I feel the sanctity of showing this as well. And I must say, on some levels, we went in there naive, right? Because we'd, I'd had experience with lots of different curanderos, different shamans. Uh, this was my first toad experience and Octavio was my guide into that experience. And we could tell that's a lot of toad medicine, but we don't have mm -hmm. the context, but also, we don't have the triggers that you have around that. And I wanted to show that it is sacred. And for him, as he said, that was what he collected. That was what they did in one time. And it was a lot of medicine. And not all practitioners do that. Not all practitioners have that access to that much medicine and go it out. That is more of a reflection of Octavio. And as you see, even with the, the medicine scenes, I know what you're saying about pornography. I would say it's intimate. And I would hope it's sacred. And for people that do have that cultural uh, sensitivity, like you're from the region and you have a relationship with the medicine and the toads, for you to see it, I can see how that would be triggering. You know, and I, I, I can say that we really did our best to portray uh, what we saw of that culture and to try to counterbalance that. And I can see how that would be confronting. And that was what we filmed, you know? It's like some people, there's, mm -hmm. been, there's been a lot of, in the 5MEO community, it's like, wow, those medicine scenes were really shocking really brutal, like exorcism was said, you know? Mm -hmm. And for me, I totally understand. And it's like, I did not want to edit it because I also don't want to glorify 5-MEO toad culture. That was really hard work. Those people, you know, especially Tess, our friend with the vomiting and the tetany that was in mm -hmm. and that stuff, that was really <coughs> purging, that was really intimate. That is not pornography, but that is as intimate as a sexual act. I'm not referring you know, to the personal experience. I know, with the medicine you the saw on the table. That's, this is what I mean. I I, I hear what you. What is the yeah. need? What is the need behind that? What is the need behind showing how do I identify the toad? What is the need in showing how do we extract the venom? So we we every talked about this. Here, summer after summer, goes to the Sonoran Desert to find the toads and I know. the toads, and now we're in an ecological crisis. We talked about this pandemic. before we made the film, and you were concerned about the duty of care in showing this, and I totally understand. And you know what I've learned in the two years since. Octavio believes he's the one who's reintroduced it to the Seri, but you know, Octavio has his perspective, but I've been meeting so many other Mexican practitioners, so many other people that also have been promulgating the medicine. And you know, it's like, it's like there's some streams and there's a river and then there's a waterfall. It's like, but it's gushing. 5-MEO is coming back through the toad, through synthetic, through the planet itself. And yes, the container of the practitioner and the ceremony sh must be sacred and is so integral. And Octavio, you know, he has a very yeah, strong personality. I mean, there's people that are damaged, there's people that end up with blood in their face, there's people that choke with, while he's purging water down their throat while under the most powerful entheogen of the planet. Yeah. What, why, why is that being condoned? Why? I'm not necessarily, I, I've worked in the two years since with Octavio uh, and really as a peer, trying to get him to say, hey, you know, like when we first came into this and what we're showing in the film, we knew this much. And now with other practitioners, I've seen a variety of styles. I believe that Octavio has a right to do the shamanic ceremony in broad strokes in the way he does it, i.e. in nature, standing up. The water thing, uh, I don't necessarily think it's necessary and it can be invasive. And I've given him feedback on that. Um, you know, and I've seen other practitioners who do have their own quirks on things. and. Pretty much everyone thinks their way is the way. What I really have understood by seeing a multiplicity of practitioners, there are multiple ways as long as the duty of care and the standards and you know are there. And in in some circumstances, Octavio really has learnt and, and been forced and had this feedback that he has to improve his game. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I mean we're dealing with such sensitive material in the sense that you know shamanism is a very much an something that has been held through the lineage of indigenous people and here are like two white guys making a show about shamanism because there's obviously huge sensitivities with the imperial legacy of westerners coming in co-opting things mm -hmm. so as documentary filmmakers obviously we're trying to 
you know, I'm trying to cinematically portray something that's visually interesting to kind of, you know, allow a lot larger audience to just be kind of exposed to the material. But there is sensitivity around, you know, this medicine and, you know, all the medicines as a, you know, we would continue to make episodes of this. So we're conscious it's of that. very delicate, yeah. And it's very delicate. And, um, you know, at the same time, though, what's said in the episode is that we were once a global shamanic culture and we will one day return to being a global shamanic culture because this was global. It wasn't one specific culture's, you know, sacrament. So even in areas of the West that, you know, lost the legacy of shamanism through an imperial culture that took over and co-opted things, you know, that's part of what we're hoping to represent is that we know people, you know, locally that have, have had a life tra life changing transformations and have found the call to, you know, working with these things as well. And again, hopefully that can be done with the respect and the lineage of the indigenous communities. And, you know, in general, I think, you know, 20th and 21st century culture, this is the first time we've had media to film this type of stuff. And so we're sort of learning as we go. But you look at anthropologists for the last, you know, few decades when they do film tribal peoples and you see grainy footage stuff, there's... Yeah, there, there's a dynamic at play which is different. If you're in a ceremony and someone's filming you, it's very different than just doing the ceremony on its own. So mm -hmm. it is an awkward yet we feel necessary filter as filmmakers to try to do the best we can to hold space to show what's going on in these ceremonies. If someone was to show a Catholic Mass and they have the sacrament and they hold the Eucharist up, to some Catholics of the older generations, that might be sacrilege. That might trigger them as well, you know? Um, yeah. We do the best we can. The other concern, there's like levels and layers of concern, right? What another layer of concern that kind of permeates the whole thing is the story of the series is not true. Well, it depends who you ask in the series, and I know this is very true in uh, Australian Aboriginal communities as well. There's power factions, there's hierarchies, there's certain elements of the tribe who are on one side so and other sides. They're so desperate that they'll say one thing one person one day and then you show up from the other way and you give them a little bit of money and they'll say whatever you want them to say and they'll write a letter and they'll stamp it and they'll sign I it. I know all these stories intimately from multiple perspectives and I probably know it more than most. You know your perspective on it? I've heard about three or four or five and well, I believe I, Octavio, I he has the permission you know, to work with the chants, he's been given that, he has the authority of the chief of the tribe, is a Puma Robles um, and there's other power factions, it gets complicated. There's village politics, and I totally agree. Independent of Octavio, the Seri have been working with the medicine. There's no, the, the No, listen. There's traditional uh, dynamics going on, which we see even in ayahuasca culture, of commodification, of uh, selling the medicine outside the tribe from village people that have nothing to do with Octavio. There's essentially a profaneness that is going on because they've now re recognized the value of the medicine. And what we then have to ask is, it's a very scarce resource. There's a sustainability issue around the toads themselves. They're living creatures. There's multiple players, and not just because of Octavio. There's, I, there's hundreds of 5-MEO practitioners that, you know, out there. Like, I know a lot of them, and I've heard of other ones as well. Where are they, all they getting their medicine from? It's not from Octavio. It's from the different tribal cultures who recognize the value and are now on selling into the Western demographic stream. Not people just going down and poaching because they've seen a documentary. Complex socio-political dynamics, which are a bit long for us to get into, but I totally agree. And I would love to talk to you about it. Let's do a podcast. <laughs> Let's continue this conversation. Let's really get into the nitty gritties. Yeah. I don't want to silence this. It's really we important we talk about this. Yeah. The route that we're going because it's not pretty where we're going because you know all of these new practitioners that are coming up were exposed to the medicine through Octavio. <coughs> no, no. Let's, he might tell you that. I know multiple streams now. I've seen a wider spectrum of uh, lineages, you could say. And you're from Sonora. Maybe Octavio dominates that tribe or that you know cultural influence, and he's got a very strong personality. So the ripples of his his uh, effects, but Annie, it's bigger than Octavio. Let's, it's bigger yeah. than all of us. You know, this is something this coming back. We have, we have, we could do another. You know, uh, twelve minutes. Tw yeah, fifteen minutes or so. So, um, the conversation Thank will be you, continued. Annie. Thank you, Annie. Thank, Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. yeah. Thanks for Super sharing. Important. Yes, and it is sharing. And thanks for bringing it up. Because yeah, we want to bring up every side of the you know full spectrum, full spectrum. I um wanted you had spoken of this awesome theory that we've been being prepared for this to hold our lives together. And I wondered, did you notice the people who don't have experience with other psychedelics not taking well to this? Yeah, there's various degrees because people might have a, a sensitivity or an inner aptitude whether they don't know because they haven't taken a psychedelic. They might be very sensitive, whatever. 
I've seen some people, some clients that, you know, if they have a full release, it might just be the white out and they don't remember it. They don't have that internal psychic structure to help them prepare for it or, or integrate it in the, the peak of the experience itself. Um, but, you know, as Eugene said before, I think, you know, meditators, I know uh, one guy who's been running retreats specifically for meditators and doing uh, Vipassana style, you know, with the medicine and ego, you know, death or, or loss. Um, and preparation can be there and preparation can be <coughs> groomed and prepared for people. But it, 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 even the meditators who have been doing this say that basically it's this rocket <coughs> fuel that takes them further than they've ever gone. But with the meditation techniques, it enables them to have context for it. So, yeah, but on, on the other inverse level, there's this incredible, profound heart intimacy of recognition. It's like going home. It's like, you. I feel on a soul level, it just, it's like, ah, you know, you know it. And you don't necessarily need words for it. But it's about how much, as we've said before, how much people can release, how much they can open, how much clearing and blockages might happen on a, on a somatic level of the body. Um, but it is uh, a pretty universal experience once people do let go. Yeah, I think with, just to follow up with the surrender piece is, is kind of the, the ingredient that's necessary. It can be an amazing first psychedelic to start with for people. They can do fantastic with it, okay. with no prior psychedelic experience. Right. And if they're white knuckling their, their psyche, it can be terrifying. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, one, I want to say that I've, I've been very blessed to have been uh, introduced to Fabi Mio and been part of a uh, a temple culture around it that is deeply consecrated has hold a great space and it requires, as I, because it's so powerful, the context to be held with deep consecration. Uh, secondly, in terms of my, my experience, the memory is not always a cognitive one, always a cellular one. And so it for me has been more a matter of reawakening uh, a cellular memory that I think had always had been dormant. And uh, I know you've mentioned death a few times, Joseph. I, I, I view it as a transition, but not, but not an ending. <laughs> it's, it's really a, a, an awakening and, uh, and a, and a yeah, rebirth on some level. And that I have noticed that it does have a cumulative effect. And so that with successive times that I've been doing it, kind of like tuning up my vehicle, you know, three or four times a year, uh, for the last few years, uh, I'm noticing that my emotional set point or my vibrational presence definitely feels like it's on the rise and my highs are high and my lows are higher <laughs> than, than they've ever been. And uh, I, I just, you know, I, I know it can be very scary to release to that type of experience, but in truly just releasing into being a vibrational presence. I have never experienced anything so multi-orgasmic, samadhi-like, and I'm not sure, I'm sure there are other words in other traditions that would describe it. And uh, yeah, I just want to honor not only the great work that you've done in just exposing the world to one aspect of the possibilities of how that could be administered. And I also want to let people know that there are many practitioners out there, and that the context and the practitioner and the space that is con is created around it uh, is everything, as well as your own willingness to survive. Yeah, and we can only all ever speak to our own direct experiences. That's ultimately, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm Bill uh, with uh, USONA, and I first want to say that I thought the film was extremely well done. It's a, it's a mm. very beautiful film. Uh, what I hope personally, though, is that we will look back on this film and see it as a point in history and that very soon that there will be no toads ever harvested again for their toxin. That there are uh, coming very soon uh, some alternatives, particularly for uh, research and for people who have the correct licenses for this material. And that uh, you know this will go the way of rhino horns and elephant tusks. Mm. Uh, and we, we will uh, honor the gift of knowledge that the code has provided, but discontinue immediately the harvesting of this precious animal. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to say as well that um, you know it's not just the toad. There's plant kingdom has five meo DMC. There's tribes uh, 
the sequoia in Ecuador who use uh, and the yahe. Yeah, States so it's, it, it's yeah. there's there's a lot of really uh, urgent issues to look at around the sustainability of the toad. But I think if uh, people are wanting to work with the medicine externally from a catalyst, the plant kingdom, which is a lot more you know reproducible and sustainable, um, Phalaris grass, which was sort of big in the early 90s, you know, when the psychedelic sort of revolution kicked off again. And that has um, yeah, but there's a different concentrations as well. Uh, but, you know, there's other components to it. There's the Yopo seeds as well in some cultures. But also, I really feel there's something uh, very very guided happening with, with 5-MeO, no matter what the catalyst is, where it's really aligning and purifying and activating, and it's saying, do this. Like, you can do this once you've had this activation, and it may be 20 years of meditation. You don't need the external thing. It's like we are the medicine, and that 5-MeO is the gateway to that mystical experience. But because we've forgotten, we need the plant kingdom and Mother Gaia to reach out again through her other creatures in symbiosis and say, wake the fuck up, right? This is what it's all about. This is the web of life. This is unity consciousness, and come back to the garden. So um, whether it's in the future synthetic for a lab or whether we entrain ourselves as a you know, global community to come back into a not mystical, not even religious, but a spiritual relationship with the planet and ourselves, I think that is going to be part of the future, yeah. Is there anywhere else where you're showing the film in the near future? I'm glad you asked, sir. Uh, <laughs> Martin Ball, who is a, a preeminent expert on, on the, at least in the synthetic 5-MeO DMT, hosts an annual conference in Ashland. It's going to be Thursday and Friday, May 25, 26 this year. The Beyond Psychedelics? Exploring Psychedelics. Exploring psychedelics. Uh, and it's a free conference up at the Ashland uh, University up there in Oregon. And I'll be speaking and there'll be quite a few other 5MEO uh, commentators who will be there. And uh, you can check that out at uh, Exploring Psychedelics. www.exploringpsychedelics.org. And if anybody needs a, a handbill, I just happen to have a <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, yeah, we, we could do a few more minutes or we could wrap it up here if anybody has any, any pressing last questions. questions. Um, as an herbal medicine maker and now a botanical medicine researcher, what advice would you give to people who are interested in this kind of work? Like, what can they expect? Some, somebody's here could probably speak. Sorry. Anyone in the audience? Yeah, anyone in the audience who can speak uh, to this I, extremely I can well. address that. Uh, Please, yes, sir. Yes, yes, Thanks, Kyle, sir. So as somebody who may have experience with um, both the tofu photoxin, uh, various plant extracts, and various synthetics, what I would say is from an energy, who is also very, very energetically trained, has worked in alchemy with spagyrics and, and plant resonances, it totally understands that. What I can say is the differences overall, as Rack pointed out before, are incredibly subtle. Meaning that each one of them, within the proper dose range, giving the person who's ready to open, will have its effect of the full opening. Um, you can take two synthetics, let's just call it that, and put them side by side. They're going to do exactly the same, same things, but like two identical varietals of a wine that come from different vineyards, each one, one's going to be sweeter, one's going to be drier. But within a spiritual context, and this, you know, I have noticed no distinction qualitatively, energetically, between the toad bufotoxin, which certainly has its own vibrational frequency, but between those uh, extracts of Varola Theodora and Yopo, um, and synthetics, they're all delivering the same result in terms of being able to get an individual to a nervocalpal somatic experience. Are there going to be slight variations in flavor, vibrational resonance? Yes, because it's the nature of you know what it is that you're pulling from. Um, but overall, they're identical. <laughs> yeah. This might be the last question. Yeah, let's yeah. probably make this the last. Uh, I'm yeah. Just wondering, I guess, um, uh, for, as far as the variation in your experience, is it doing this multiple times, how similar, I mean, because as far as, it sounds like the billions of those similar for a lot of people with a lot of the same stuff comes up, the opening, the white light, but yeah, I guess I'm just curious how, how different each experience is.
is this something I need to write about in your own life and what you're teaching about this personally or yeah. just all those things, yeah. Yeah, well everybody's the thing about us is like everybody's, you know, so unique. So everybody's experience is quite unique. I mean there's similar similar dynamics that happen to eat to to similar corollaries that happen with the medicine to everybody, but my experience was so different than anything that you saw on the on the footage there. And there is a, there is something going on with ancient yogic practices and this and the sacrament, the corollaries with what happens. Um, so with ap what happens when you're in those samadhi states and that like you know whatever source may be you know whether or not that's like divine mind or where we all come from. There's definitely a corollary with source and at lower doses things that happen to you that are very yogic like in this you know space this realm. So do you want to kind of um, you know, wrap that up? There's sort of a spectrum of um, reactions, but I think people, everyone will go across that spectrum, you know, more or less. Like we saw quite a diversity in the, the participants in the ceremony at the end, that really deep somatic body catharsis and purging and, you know, the tetany going with the body, or Joelle got up and she was dancing and moving the energy around, yeah. uh, or everyone pretty much, you know, holding it and then going down. Um, on the inside, it's really about what we've discussed previously about the surrender and the opening and how much people can let go. And the more you let go into it, the more you become it. And then that's the, just a universal reservoir of consciousness, which is right back there that I think all humans share and pull into that central source of where consciousness comes from. So we all get to that same central source in the end. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you only heal you. Yeah, so just these to make things. A quick comment. If somebody wants yeah. to look at, uh, I would say, a good book on this from a preliminary point of view, Martin Ball's Entheogenic Evolution, which is one of his first books after writing uh, writing about 5 MeO DMT after his early experiences, um, it are, is probably the best in that in that book. He outlines various types of experiences, what I refer to as archetypal presentments, how people show, and that can look or how they how they present, and that can look such in a variety, wide variety of ways, from people being rock solid Buddha types that just expand into the infinite with <laughs> no resistance, to primal screamers, cosmic infants, runners, purgers, um, you know, ecstatics, orgasmics, the, the, the spectrum is wild and wide in terms of how it presents. Right. Martin Ball. Uh, it's The Entheogenic Evolution by Dr. Martin Ball, PhD. Uh, I do not believe there are hard copies available of it still, but you can find it uh, in PDF formats on the internet. So all right. thank you yeah. all for coming. This was uh, episode you. one of Shamans of the Global Village, and please help spread the word. Uh, thank you to Dr. Joseph Bartuglia, Alex Ward, Niles Heckman, I'm Rakazam. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.